what are the basic principles of virology? Maybe a good place to start is what is a virus? That's great. I mean, I talk in my first lecture for 20 minutes before I get to that. <laughs> but, and I wonder if I should put it up front, but it's kind of a boring definition. So if you do that first, people will turn off. So first you tell them about all the millions and billions of <laughs> viruses around. So a virus, we have a very specific definition because it's different from everything else on the planet. Um, because it's, first of all, it's a parasite. It takes, a parasite means you take something from someone else. You know, we have human parasites who take money from others, right? But in biological terms, uh, a parasite takes something from the host that w the host would otherwise use energy or some building block or something. Like There's that. never really a symbiotic relationship between a virus and a host. <clears throat> well, there, there can be. So that's the dichotomy, I think, is that we define them as parasites. Yet, I just told you 20 minutes ago that many viruses are probably beneficial. So I think what it means is we, at some point, we're going to have to change our definition, right? Because uh, after all, definitions we make are just constructs that make it easier for us to study, that not necessarily represent what's right. Yeah, right? like uh, like Pluto was a planet at first, and now it's not a planet it's anymore, not. and a lot of people are very upset. But it's only according to us. There may be another race living somewhere else who thinks it's a planet, right? Well, maybe that's why viruses are attacking humans. They're very angry. They weren't uh, <laughs> calling them parasites. So right now our definition includes parasite because a virus cannot do anything without a cell. If, if, I, if this mug were full of viruses, it would not do anything for years. It would eventually probably lose its infectivity but it's not going to reproduce here. It needs cells. And you know, to the first people who discovered viruses, that was astounding that they didn't just reproduce, divide on their own like mm -hmm. bacteria. So a virus needs to get inside of a cell, inside the cell. It can't just hang around on the surface. It needs to get in in order to make more of itself. And so we call it an obligate intracellular parasite because it needs to get in a cell and then it takes things from the cell in the form of all kinds of molecules and processes and energy and so forth to make new viruses. Uh, obligate means it's obligated to be inside the cell. Absolutely. Okay. It will not reproduce outside of the cell. So this mug of viruses is can in no way be living, in my opinion. However, once it gets inside of a cell, now the cell is a virus-infected cell. It's alive. Mm -hmm. So a virus, in my view, has two phases, right? It's this non-living particulate phase that everyone is used to. Uh, yeah, I'll send you, you need a virus for your table. I'll send you a nice mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. I think it would look good which, here. Which, yes, definitely. You know, to go with all this other stuff. Yeah, well, these are all mechanical. There's no biology here. So you wouldn't want a virus here? No, I'd want a virus, of course. No, I'll send you one. And then I would you love can, that. You can look at it. Because now that we have the three-dimensional structures solved by structural biologists, we take the coordinates and we put it in a 3D printer and you can make amazing models, right? Mm. And, of, and, of any virus. And so there's a huge variety of viruses? Huge, of, that we know of, yeah. which is only a fraction of what's out there. What's the categories? So there's RNA, there's DNA viruses. What What are those? What's so DNA and RNA? Two, two, <laughs> two broad categorizations. The RNA, and D, these are genetic material. Mm -hmm. Can be two different chemicals. So RNA... Well, everything else on the planet besides viruses is all DNA-based. You and I are DNA-based. Everything on the planet today is DNA-based, except some viruses are RNA-based. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, the first life that arose on the planet was RNA-based. Yeah, so these are like old-school viruses. These are old-school. These are what we call relics, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're relics. And this has got a name. It's called the RNA world, which I think is great. Is it big still, or are, they, are the relics dying out? Oh, no, the relics, in my opinion, are the most successful viruses, the RNA viruses. And SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. We can mm -hmm. talk about why they're so successful. But you have, broadly speaking, viruses with RNA, genetic information, which are relics. Of course, they're contemporary. They have adapted to the modern world <laughs> and the modern organisms living in it. And then we have DNA-based viruses, which are extremely conservative and slow, they're very successful. You know, everyone has a herpes virus infection, but they are, they don't get the news like the RNA viruses do, the HIVs and the influenza viruses and the um, SARS coronaviruses. They get all the press and they're RNA-based because RNA lets you change more so than DNA.
So they, they evolve much faster, the RNA viruses. Much faster. And in fact, when I, I have an electron evolution, I don't know if you've listened to that one. You should. It's really, I think it's really interesting. RNA viruses exist at their error threshold, which means they can't make any more mutations when they reproduce. Otherwise, they're dead. They would wow. go extinct. They're, they're evolving at their error threshold. DNA viruses are hundreds of times lower than their error thresholds. Wow. And we know this. We can do an experiment to find that out. Now, why that is is a good question. Uh, but uh, that's, the, that's the reason why RNA viruses are far more successful. They yeah. infect many more hosts. And they're very, I would say, slippery. They can change hosts really quickly. Because in any animal harboring an RNA virus, like let's say a bat in some cave somewhere, it's not just one genome. It's, it's millions of different genomes of all all kinds, with, all within the framework of, say, coronavirus, but they're all different. And one genome in there might just be right for infecting a person if it ever encountered that person. I mean, that's the thing that... Or there could be a large number. It's a tiny fraction, but a large number of, uh, of them. And they're all operating at the at the threshold of uh, that's right. error. That's right. That's fascinating. It's like little like uh, it's like startups, little entrepreneurs, like a startup it, world. Yes, and many of them fail. Yeah, many, many of them the changes fail. And then there's the DNA viruses that are like the IBM and the exactly, Google, exactly the big corporations. It's very good. That I like that. Become conservative with the bureaucracies and all that kind of stuff. So they, they have a lot of baggage. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's expensive for them to reproduce. Yeah, <laughs> and they don't move quickly. Yes, the RNA viruses are the fast moving members. So that's what a virus is. We call them uh, obligated intracellular parasites. And then I told you there's DNA and RNA, but then let's go further. The, the nucleic acid is not naked because naked nucleic acid in the world isn't good. I mean, it, it existed in the, in the pre-cellular world, but there probably weren't a lot of threats to it then. Naked nucleic acid doesn't last long in the environment. So they're, they're covered. The nucleic acid is, is covered. It can be covered with a protein shell, a pure protein shell, mm -hmm. or it can have a membrane around it, which would be uh, lipids from the host cell. So uh, lipids, so it's, it's a fatty membrane. Fatty membrane. Yeah, so our cells are coated with fatty membranes, right? Our cells, the outer plasma yeah, membrane, right? That's the same. But viruses thing. can be too. So they're kind of like cells, but without the ability to do the mitochondria stuff. Some some are. Some are, they don't have nuclei. They don't have mitochondria. Yeah. But they do have a nucleic acid. They, they have a membrane. And then of course there are spikes in the membrane mm -hmm. that allow them to attach to cells. And so that completes our, our two different kinds. So of they have, virus. they all have like attachment mechanisms, like yeah. ways to, like keys into the, they, the they all have to get into cells. There are, there are a couple of exceptions, though. Uh, there are viruses of fungi uh, and uh, plants. So let's do the fungi. F fungi would be like yeast. Uh, the virus the yeast cell wall is pretty hard to get through. So viruses typically don't attach to a yeast and get inside. Rather, they they just live in the yeast forever. Yeah, and they multiply as mostly nucleic acids, and as the yeast divide, they go into the daughter cells, and that's mm -hmm. how they exist. Plant viruses, also the plant cell wall, would be very hard to get across with a by binding a protein. So plant viruses get into plants either by pests that inject them in, they're sucking sap out, and they inject virus at the same time, or farmers, they have contaminated farm equipment, and they roll over the plants and introduces viruses. So those fungi and plant viruses, they don't have this specific receptor binding to get them into the cell, but everything else, yeah, the virus binds to something on the surface, very specific, it's taken into the cell because that's what cells do. When things bind their exterior, mm -hmm. they take it in because in most cases it's good, it's something they need. And so the virus slips in, I guess you'd call that a Trojan horse, right? Trojan horse, it's so hard to not <laughs> anthropomorphize this whole thing. It is hard. So obviously uh, they don't know any of this. It's not an actual Trojan horse. So th they, they're they not getting actually tricked in the way humans trick each other. No, it's all passive. And it's just through so many years of evolution, it's you select something that works and it continues. And what survives then goes on with a perhaps a slightly passive. different approach. 
I love this idea of past, of course, according to Sam Harris. Uh, so from a sufficiently intelligent alien civilization observing humans, our behavior might seem passive too, because they understand <laughs> fully exactly what we're doing. And then there's no free will and we're all just operating in the same way. It could be. A cell yeah. does, but just a much higher level of complexity. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the d distinction between active and passive. I mean, the point is, I think anthropomorphizing to a certain extent is fine because it helps people understand. But when you start to say, I think that the virus is doing that because then you're putting a human lens on it and you may be wrong. Yeah. Because you don't know why things happen for a virus. Um, so right now we have variants emerging and people say, well, I think it's because the antibodies are selecting for variants. That's a good idea, but it may not be the only thing that's going Why right, you start imagining them coming to the table negotiating <laughs> yeah, it, you get into trouble with that. That's why. That's why I tell my students: be careful about the anthropomorphizing, because you're going to apply your values to a virus, and you have different value. You're a human, and you have what you think is the reason for this outcome may not be right. That's all. Just be open minded. Yeah. About it in both directions. I actually one of the things that pushed back on is in in the space of robotics people, most people in robotics try to n not anthropomorphize. Mm -hmm. For example, they don't give a gender or a name to robots. They really try to see it as a machine. And to me, that makes sense in one, in, in one way, but it totally doesn't make sense in another. If that robot is to interact, operate in the human world and interact with humans, we have to, we have to anthropomorphize it in order to understand as an engineering problem, mm. How should it operate in a human world? Now, the difference with viruses, the scale of operation, it doesn't make sense to treat them as human-like because the scale of operation is much smaller. But with robots, you're in the same sure. time scale, the same spatial scale. And of course, in the movies, they always give them names and personalities. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, that's the movie. But that's my argument is we should do the same when you're trying to solve the engineering problem mm. of robotics too. It's not just for the movies.